Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I'm Pamela Hastings, and welcome to another Barometer webcast. We've had a very volatile past few days, and uh, we're here to discuss that. On today's webcast, David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President, will provide us with a brief macro overview. We've asked our Head of Trading, Diana Avador, to join us today and speak to the color and flows that she's seeing on the trading desk and specifically how investors out there should be reading bond flows. With that, I turn the conversation over to David. And of course, at the tail end of this conversation, we would be pleased to address your questions. So don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or send your question via the chat via Zoom. Thanks so much and happy afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice Always to see pleasure. you too, Diana. <laughs> um, what, I, what I think we're going to do today is uh, we've had a few questions about some of the choppiness in the stock market. Certainly, there are parts of the market that have been correcting. The question is, is it something more than that? What, what is the message we should be taking away from this market? Bonds uh, have been very strong over the last few weeks. Yields have come back lower, uh, which I think is a surprise to many looking at a reopening in the economy. Um, lots of things always to think about. Certainly COVID is still front and center, uh, but uh, we're gonna take a look at some pictures uh, and some of our indicators and some of the economic data uh, and see what we can take away. So uh, just to, to kick off, uh, as we always do, um, take a step back and say from 30,000 feet, what is the, the sort of core backdrop that we think we're working against? Uh, because our job is to make sure that the portfolios are structured for the environment that we're in. We tend to look very little like the market itself. We tend to get very focused in big structural themes. Uh, and so important just to look at the asset class level, sort of where the, where the, where the strength is, uh, and where, where we might have a positive structural backdrop. So just starting with equities, this is the US stock market back to 1900. Uh, you can see in light blue, there have been several structural bear markets that went on for long periods of time where market really made no progress. Uh, lots of, uh, lots of uh, steps forward and step back in each case. Over time, in each of those cases, investors became very frustrated uh, and the stock market became unloved. And generally through those periods, companies did continue to grow, perhaps grew into the valuations that they had coming into those bear markets. And by the time the market would take off into one of these dark blue periods, a structural bull market, stocks were unloved, probably very good value, uh, and, then, and then performed very well going forward in sort of three steps forward, one step back fashion. So we think that we kicked off a structural bull market in 2013 with the U.S., being the leading stock market in the world and the first one to take out multi-year highs going back to the year 2000. And the market has been working its higher and fits and starts since. When we look at fixed income and the long-term interest rates, you know, we believe we've gone through or have been going through a structural bottoming in yields. Uh, hence the reason we want to talk about bond yields today because bond yields have pulled back somewhat over the last few weeks. And the question is, you know, are we actually seeing a turn or is it, is it aborting? Uh, because what works during falling interest rates like we've had since 1981 is really quite different than what works during rising interest rates, which we saw from shortly after the Second World War as we entered a reflationary period and economic activity picked up, uh, the baby boom started to spend more money. <clears throat> in fact, interesting to know that the millennial cohort is larger than the baby boom cohort, uh, but that drove a different type of investment uh, strategy than maybe what we've seen over the last few years. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then just as we work our way around the asset classes, we do believe we've been going through a structural bottoming and commodity prices, <clears throat> which have been out of favor for many years and in the last year uh, have had a good strong bid. Uh, which tends to point to stronger economic activity and certainly, if nothing else, a cyclical business cycle, but likely points to something more than that. So just starting from the top, as I always do, here is the S&P 500 going back over the last year. The last time we had some bumpiness in the S&P was in September and October as we headed into fall, often is the case as we hit the election, uh, the market really sort of took off and it's been in this channel ever since. 
working its way higher. Now, clearly the S&P is not representative of every stock. Uh, it's heavily dominated by five or six very large companies that make up about 20% of the index. We all know which companies those are, uh, but certainly it's been, it's been very consistent. And to put it in perspective, you know, this was the breakout in 2013. We had some bumpiness in 15, 16. We certainly had a good size pullback, sharpest uh, bear market in history, actually, in 2018 and the end of the year. We had a very sharp pullback uh, in the beginning of COVID and the market's been working its way higher since. So S&P has been in pretty good shape, continues to be in the channel. NASDAQ 100, quite similar, uh, had a period from about March through uh, the middle of June where it consolidated its gains that had been in place since the fall, since the spring of 2020, but ultimately was able to break out. Now, in the second year of a bull market, very often you can get rolling corrections where certain groups will pause, consolidate while other groups carry on. Uh, but the NASDAQ got through that period. And I think a lot of investors look forward with interest to the earnings that'll come out over the next couple of weeks <clears throat> for a lot of the biggest technology companies in the US. If I take that longer term view in the NASDAQ 100, it broke out of the range it was in in 2016. It had been in that range since 2000. So I believe, and we believe we're in a structural bull market in the NASDAQ that really only began five years ago and structural bull markets tend to last 15, 18 years. Um, when we take the TSX, it's certainly continued to be in the channel, but certainly over the last few weeks pulled back and into the lower end of the channel. Uh, but it has been strong, in fact, making relative new highs versus the S&P. So the TSX has been outperforming the S&P recently. And the, the TSX, after being in a range until 2018, finally broke out of its range. Once it broke out, pulled back during the beginning of COVID, and I believe is in a new structural bull market here as well. So each of these geographic regions have kicked off structural bull markets at different times, but the commonality is they're all equity indices, different parts of the world. We can pull up lots of different global markets like Taiwan or Japan or Korea uh, that are broken out of long, long bear markets. Uh, and the more markets that are in a bull mode, the stronger the equity asset class can be considered. So, um, where do we, what do we worry about? Well, this is the equally weighted S&P 500. So it takes out the impact of the very large weights of the biggest tech stocks. And like the NASDAQ consolidating uh, through the late part of 2020 and early part of 2021, the equally weighted S&P 500 has really been consolidating since the beginning of May. And you can see we've been in this range. We've tested the lower end of the range three times. What that means is that the average stock in the S&P 500 is underperforming the very largest. It has been a more concentrated market that causes us to be a little bit more cautious. We'll talk about that, but that's something that we're watching closely. The one thing I would say is that the length of time so far, 86 days, is roughly one quarter three month consolidation is not an unusual thing. When we get consolidations or corrections in markets, they come in time by marking their way sideways or in price. Uh, so far, we're seeing a little combination of both, about just about 6% top to bottom in the, rest, in the um, uh, unweighted index and about 90 days. Um, this is the, the commodities uh, index, the, the Rogers Commodity Index. It's an equally weighted commodity index it's been in a channel really again since November of last year, but like the equally weighted S&P has been consolidating sideways for almost three months now. So what do we take away from our breadth readings? As many will know, what we care about is what's happening to the average company. And over time, are more companies entering uptrends or fewer and fewer maintaining uptrends? And as we've been talking about over the last few weeks, we've seen some deterioration in the percent of stocks in uptrends. In other words, several weaker issues have broken down out of their trends. And where we, where we had close to 80% of companies in the NYSE in uptrends, we're now sitting below 50%. 
Canada's breadth has been narrowing and global breadth has been narrowing. Short-term indicators, percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average has also been moving lower. And as we sit today, now at the low end of a historical range, which points certainly to correction, if not something more. Also the percent of stocks uh, with positive weekly price momentum or upward trajectory has been uh, obviously moderating again over the last few weeks. So that causes us to be a little bit more cautious we have been reticent to be putting on new positions. When the models are weakening, we're cautious about doing that. We're very critical of the existing positions to say, should we be reducing our exposures? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but this has been the backdrop. So the question is, is this something bigger than a correction or a consolidation? And we have to always assess that day by day with the data that we have coming in. The first thing that we would look at right now is that the commodities index having just broken out of a long-term bear market actually continues to be quite sound. So if a concern is that we're headed into some kind of an economic slowdown that's unforeseen by the market, you know, what types of things would give us those clues? And as it sits right now, commodity prices are not doing that. The bond market is showing us something to think about. So when we look at the price of a 30 year 20 to 30 year bond, the TLT ETF, which holds a basket of long-term US government treasury bonds, we've seen that prices were moving lower from the, be from the beginning of the pandemic, meaning yields were moving higher. And we got to a point in March where yields hit a near-term high and we hit the long-term moving average. And since then, bond prices have bounced. So the question I think that investors are asking is what is the market telling us? Is it that there is not growth coming at us? Is it that there is some kind of a, a recession ahead? Uh, what should it tell us as to what to do with other assets? And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that and a couple of takeaways that I would throw on the table first, and Diana will join us to talk about this, is that first of all, when we look at investment grade and high yield bonds, the excess return that investors are demanding to take risk by buying a corporate bond versus a government bond continues to be very, very low. So when people get concerned about economic, uh, future economic strength, they tend to start asking for a higher premium to buy a corporate debt. This has not been the case. When, <clears throat> when, we, when we look at those spreads, we, we should start to see them bump higher if there was some real concern. In fact, we talked last week about the fact that there have been a record number of companies have their credit upgraded over the past quarter. A couple other things that stand out to me, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk to Diana a little bit is if we have a supplier to a lot of the world in many, many types of goods. And you can see that after breaking out of the range that China was in for many years from 2015, as often happens, we pulled back and retested that breakout. And really now since February, the Chinese market has slowly been marking its way higher in this consolidation. So no sign of a major breakdown there. When we take emerging markets, after breaking out of their long range, they pulled back into the breakout point and have worked their way higher, no sign of major problem there. And then when we think of the goods that China uses to produce commodity prices like nickel, they've maintained their strength. Aluminum has maintained its strength. Iron has made the copper has pulled back really that would be quite typical to see after an asset breaks out of a long range to pull back and consolidate but again still not sitting down at its bottom end of the range despite some sloppiness in the stock market so i've asked diana to join us today to talk a little bit about what could be some of the contributing causes to strengthen the bond market beyond major concerns for economic growth. 
Yes, certainly COVID is an issue, and we're seeing some ramp up in cases in various parts of the world, so that would be a cause for concern. But Diana, give me some of your thoughts on this. Okay, um, I, I would I would characterize the last two months as a two step item. Um, Ten year yields in the U.S. have rallied to about one seventy about two months ago on concern that there was going to be a tightening in financial conditions by Jerome Powell, the chair of Fed. Um, who kept reiterating that it, inflation is transitory and that the conditions um, for the quantitative easing that they're so far uh, in the midst of, um, there was gonna be um, lots of heads up, um, there lots, of, lots of warning period that was calming the markets that that was not gonna happen and that inflation is transitory. And then initially the bond market was accepting um, his words uh, the bond market uh, started to move up a little bit because it, it, it sold off hard in anticipation of this inflationary narrative, which Jerome Powell has quelched. Um, so initially, that is what the bond market was covering, all those shorts that were inflationary of nature. Uh, in other words, believing Jerome Powell up until uh, yields were about 1.4, 1.3. And during this time, uh, economic data was coming in mixed. Still good if you step back and look at the longer term trajectory of the economic data, but expectations really, really jumped up. And so the economic data was coming short of expectations, but still in a step ladder fashion as it relates to the reopening. So um, if you step back, it was okay. The second part of the bond market rally is uh, more short term in nature. Uh, what we've been seeing and hearing from a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, strategists is um, pension funds globally, which are large, large pools of money when you look at them in the aggregate, um, are very well funded. The stock market return and bond market return of the last few years have really created a situation where their investments have performed really, really well, and there is no problem of underfundedness in the pension fund world. And so there is some um, drift in terms of their asset allocation. Um, and so some of, the, uh, some, of the, some of the bond market purchase, or some of the bond purchases were really just some reallocations off of really, really high exposure and equities. Now that they're funded, they need to keep that fundness going. That's good for their retirees. Um, so that was one part. But the second part is even shorter uh, in nature and um, not much is being discussed of this cohort. Um, it's the CTAs and the quantitative investors, um, which are very, very active and very price insensitive. Um, and um, they're just uh, a mathematical formula based on other uh, certain volatility metrics. And what happened in the last leg of this bond market rally, which really uh, would have freaked people out if you didn't know this, is that some of these quantitative strategies needed to uh, they were basically very short the bond market from the previous inflationary conversation, and they wanted to cover some of those shorts. Now, that has happened. Um, they have covered some of those shorts, means buying bonds, thereby pushing the yields down. And they're still in a short position because the narrative of the reopening and, um, you know, and, 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 and the generational low in yields, that is still relevant. However, they were very much offside. And um, as the bond market was indicating and believing Jerome Powell that inflation is transitory and yields were moving down, they felt that they were a little bit over their, their skis on their short positions and just cover some of it. And that could get a very aggressive. So we've seen yields run from 125 to 114 very quickly. And um, when you just look at it without any context, that can seem like what's the bond market telling you? Why is it rallying so hard? But really there is a, a quite a structural short-term uh, reason for it. And uh, once the news of that hit, actually uh, bond yields have actually backed up today from 114 to about 120. Um, and, and as you can see in the stock market today, it's a very, very supportive to the stock market, just a sigh of relief that there isn't something more sinister going on than that. Yeah. But certainly, certainly there has been lots of conversation where portfolio managers have said, I am concerned by the fact that the bond yields are falling. Maybe I'm missing something. I better take some money off the table. And that certainly has helped to correct and consolidate certain parts of the market. 
Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Diane. I appreciate that. I'm sure that we're going to have some questions for you uh, today at the end. I'll camera off and, and I'll be around for questions. <laughs> Great. So just going back to that to that Chinese chart and the commodity picture, interesting in the past week, data out of uh, the General Administration of Customs in China, China imports were up 36.7% year on year in June. Uh, and so certainly lots of consumption uh, and lots of need for basic materials. Let's look at some of the other uh, data from this week uh, and see what we can take away from it. Uh, when we look at initial jobless claims, again, lower this week, you can see the moving average of uh, employment claims continues to fall, still a long way from where, we, where the Fed wants to get to by way of unemployment claims. So they continue to be quite supportive. Uh, when we look at retail sales, just some blockbuster numbers. Uh, of course, year over year, retail sales were huge relative to 2020, but interesting, uh, retail sales were up 19% over 2019 numbers. Uh, which is which is quite extraordinary. Uh, so retail sales strong, uh, labor data uh, and labor uh, rates not keeping pace with that, uh, but that certainly has been a source of demand. When we look at high frequency data, uh, when we look at things like um, uh, seated dine-in activity uh, from Open Table, uh, we have see a continuation of strength in Florida, the U.S. as a, as a whole, and New York. Uh, when we look at TSA security clearances, uh, this is real-time data week by week. Uh, travel continues to ramp back up again. So there doesn't seem to be any kind of slowdown here. So um, now let's get to the important stuff. Uh, we're, we're into earnings season now. Second quarter earnings have started to be delivered. We talked a little bit about some financials earnings last week. Um, when we look at the revisions data or the path of consensus earnings per share uh, versus, um, versus um, um, uh, first quarter, we've seen a continuation of a ramp up in expectations for earnings. Now, beyond this point, as we got into first quarter, this is what continued to happen because as companies reported their numbers, they came in way ahead of expectation. And we expect likely the same thing to happen again this quarter. To look at the actual numbers, the expectation is for year over year, 70% increase in earnings after a 50% increase in earnings in the first quarter. And from a revenue perspective, a 20% increase versus a 10% increase in, in first quarter. And this may well be the peak growth quarter or peak acceleration quarter, uh, but clearly we are into a new economic cycle. Uh, and with the market having been a little bit choppy over the last few weeks, it's taken some of the excessive optimism out uh, and possibly sets up things quite well for the, for the earnings period. Keep in mind, lots of companies, the biggest source of buyers uh, of shares in the market are corporations who are buying their own shares with earnings, uh, share buybacks, uh, and they are all in a quiet period right now. They slowly come back online as they report their earnings, they're able to restart their buyback programs. Let's talk a little bit about leadership uh, and, and look a little more granular uh, view at what has been happening over the last few weeks. So as I mentioned, short, short and long-term data has been weakening. The question is, is it something that's a little bit more sinister or is it just a, a garden variety correction after a very strong first half? When we look at the IWM, which is the Russell 2000, 2000 mid, mid-sized companies, you can see really that it's been correcting since March. Now, not tons of price correction, but certainly time. And within that, certainly stronger groups and weaker groups. If you take the New York Composite Index, which is all the companies that trade on the NYSE, again, very similar to the Russell 2000, been working its way sideways within a range. We challenged the low end of the range yesterday and a big rebound rally today. So very strong. The S&P was up 1.6%. Uh, the Dow was up 1.8%. And the Russell was up. 3% today. So challenge the bolt low end of the range, but in, in each case, it seems to have held. The S&P challenged its 50-day moving average and again, rallied back up off it. But we have seen internal deterioration. Percent of stocks in the NYSE that are trading above their 50-day moving average has moved down to 22%. So what can we take from that? Well, when we corrected in the fall, in September, October, 
we got to a point where 22% or 24% of stocks were in still above their 50 day. And that was the end of it. Now that's very different than what happens in a bear market like January through March of last year when the S&P fell 50%, uh, it got as low as 2%. So it's not to say this can't turn into something that's much more dramatic, but at this point, we're sort of hitting that point where we've seen um, the type of correction that we might see. When we look at the percentage of stocks that have upward trajectory or positive weekly momentum, similar, we've now pulled back into the zone below 30% where you might see market find lows. So let's look at some groups. Leadership groups that have led off the bottom and broken out of multi-year ranges often have a pullback or consolidation once they've done that. And you can see that since the middle of April, financials have been in a range. And so the question is, is that telling us a story? Well, when we look across all of the various groups in the Russell 1000, you look at the companies that have had a percentage decline from their three-month highs, you can see the economically sensitive groups have all corrected sort of 12 to 20%. So they've had a correction to this point, whether you've seen it in the S&P or not. Not something that's unusual, because as we talked about, the large cap growth stocks paused while these economically sensitive stocks were rallying. So the S&P bank index broke out of a multi-year range, pulled back, and the percentage of stocks at a 55, a 65 day low as of last week was at 65%, similar to what happens in a correction, not similar to what happens in a bear market. Well, this week, if we take the whole financial sector and look at the percentage of companies making a three month low, we're at 51% as of yesterday. Again, similar to what we saw in the correction in 2019 and several of the corrections through 2016, 17 and 18 not similar to the bear market at the end of 2018 or the bear market in the spring of 2020. Material sector, same picture. We've now done the work of what would be typical in a correction, not typical of a bear market. So we obviously watch our reversals. We look at price action, exactly what you might expect. Copper ETF, a copper miners breaks out of a multi-year range, pulls back into the range that would be a typical correction. So what we'd like to see here is reacceleration. Today was a good day. We'll see whether it follows through. Rio Tinto is a great example of that. Iron ore and copper breaking out of the range, pulling back in a consolidation, quite normal. Uh, when we look at gold, we've talked about this over the last little while. Gold came out of a multi-year bear market, broke out last year, consolidated over the last few months. And in fact, already has broken out of that range and is back testing, but looks to be ready to go again. So you got to keep it in perspective. Materials had a giant rally from March of 2020 through the middle of May. The fact that they pulled back, this was as of last week, 6.8%. It's closer to 10% right now is something that would be quite typical coming off of that kind of a move. When we look at the energy sector now, 55% of stocks trading, making three months lows. Again, quite similar to other corrections. Uh, and when we look at some individual names like Canadian Natural Resources, broke out of a long-term bear market, pulled back into the breakout. So at this point, what I would say is that these are telling us we're having a normal correction after a first move. Uh, and that fits with the fact that when the market is up 10% in the first half, we took all the years from 1929, largely second half tends to be quite strong. Go back to China break out and pull back into the range. And then we look at volatility. Last Yesterday, we had a little spike in volatility, but again, we continue to make lower highs on each one of the little pullbacks that we've seen. So volatility isn't telling us that there's a bigger issue either. Last few things, financial conditions continue to be very easy. And we worry when financial conditions start to tighten because liquidity is the fuel that keeps the market going lots of monetary and fiscal stimulus to come, and certainly uh, low interest rates uh, off in the future for short-term rates. And then when we look at actual results, dividend increases, we've really started to see a ramping in dividend increases 
This gets us only partway through second quarter reporting period. So this number is likely to go up, but so far 68 dividend increases in the S&P over the course of the quarter, 117 quarter before, 86 the quarter before, uh, <clears throat> no suspensions uh, and only one decrease. So look, we think that conditions continue to be quite good for equities. They continue to be quite good for commodities. There is nothing in this data that tells us that reflation doesn't continue. We think it would be positive if the inflation is transitory because it hasn't been our case from the beginning that we were headed into a big period of inflation. In the 1950s and 60s, when the interest rates bottomed at 1.6%, it took until 1966 for rates to go to 5.5. And there wasn't significant inflation from 1951 until the 1970s. So we worry about inflation, but likely what's happening is just demand for goods coming out of COVID that's pushed prices up uh, in a temporary fashion, but likely we are headed into a reflationary business cycle. Just as a reminder, in the years where the S&P, sorry, the S&P 500 was up greater than 10% in the first six months, which of course we were this year, the vast majority of second half were positive with only one year with enough drawdown to make it negative for the year it was 1921 and certainly conditions are very different than 1929 today. So our job is to do three basic things is to use the tools that we have to try to identify large structural leadership themes and focus in these areas without a bias. If those conditions start to change, our job is to recognize it and look to redeploy. At this point, we haven't seen enough evidence to say that the conditions have changed. We think that likely we are consolidating and correcting, but certainly the conditions are not set up for us to go to cash because frankly, there's lots of great looking companies, lots of great looking positions that we can be invested in and financial conditions continue to be supportive. So our job is to be tactical and to make sure our positions match what's happening in the market. You can see that over the last, uh, last month. Yes, we took our financials position down a little bit through the correction. We took our energy down a little bit. We ramped back up a little bit of technology as they came out of their consolidation. And the balance of the sectors really haven't seen much change. So we watch our tools every day. We're ready to make changes as is required. But I think that in this case right now, it looks so far like this is a standard correction after a good strong run in the market uh, and, and not something that is more sinister than that. If things get more difficult, we'll be very happy to get defensive. We're very happy to hold significant cash weights or avoid sector weights when it's required. Uh, but as we move forward, there are more adjustments than major wholesale changes. And with that, Pamela, if there are some questions, happy to answer. Thanks so much, Dave. This one's from Stephen in Toronto. David, in the income and balanced funds, you were overweight financials and energy. Has your outlook changed in any way or on either sector? And how have financials performed since earnings started to be reported in the last week or two? I know you touched on a little, the few of those points earlier. Maybe you could just recap. Sure. So certainly, certainly financials, industrials, materials have all been consolidating over the last about 11 weeks. Um, it hasn't been significant or outside of the character of the companies or the sector that we're invested in that they've had some pullback. That's, that's normal in a bull market. Um, the financials as a group don't tend to run on the earnings. They tend to lag for a week or two following the earnings. Uh, when you come into earnings period and expectations have been high, you know, they don't tend to have a big jump. They're not like tech stocks that, you know, blow the doors off and have a, have a big lift. Um, but we think that the conditions remain supportive. When you ask what's changed, you know, if we, if we talk about the group as a whole, financials continue to be a very important group. Have we taken any position down? Well, yeah, we've taken down about 6% of our weight. And that's because there were some things to do in technology that we had gone to a very low weight in because they had underperformed for about six months. 
So outside of that, no major changes to our industrial weights, uh, no major changes to other sectors. So small adjustments around the edges, um, but we don't want to jump for the sake of jumping. Right. We talked last week about the fact that the bond proxy sectors are more expensive than they've ever been in history. And even with this very significant bump in bond prices, the bond proxies have not kept pace with that. So there is no major rotation going back into defensive sectors. And so uh, it doesn't, I don't think, um, cause us to need to make significant sector changes. Thanks so much. This question is for Diana. Diana, we've seen the Canadian dollar drop recently. What do you think is going to happen going forward? Canadian dollar is very correlated to commodity prices and particularly energy. Uh, the Canadian market is now diversifying. So I'm happy to say that I think that in time, may, the correlation may wane a little bit. But as Canada, we are very, very uh, uh, tiered to, to, to energy. And so uh, when the no growth trade was happening in the last month or two, uh, I mean, we've had huge rally in Canadian dollar as oil rallied throughout the year and uh, hit a high of 76. Now we've pulled back to about 66. Um, today, we oil was up about 1% uh, at 67. Um, so I think that where the oil goes is where the Canadian dollar is going. Um, if we are right and the market uh, continues to go through a reflation, um, then uh, we believe that energy will continue to be supportive and constructive, and that'll be supportive to the Canadian dollar. I cannot see a Canadian dollar continue to sell off if oil, for example, rallies. Thanks so let's much, just, Diana. Let's just take a look at that just for a second, just because... I want to put that up. So, you know, certainly you've seen a pullback in oil price and certainly at the same time, you've seen a pullback in the, in the Canadian dollar. Um, but again, as we go through the various commodity prices, you know, commodities have remained pretty darn firm. There's, there's nickel, uh, there's iron ore, uh, aluminum it's in here somewhere. So, uh, you know, I think that certainly CAD is having a pullback with, with commodities prices consolidating, uh, but I don't think it's a major shift in trend. Thanks. And uh, David, further to Diana's comments, perhaps you could just walk us briefly through how we look at positioning our por portfolios with respect to hedging the portfolios to ensure safety for our clients at all times. Yeah, so just from a, from a hedging perspective on current because most of our clients are Canadian we do have some products that are not Canadian dollar oriented products but most of our clients are Canadian dollar focused uh, we really do take currency into account so in the pools and funds that we manage we tend to keep them hedged back to Canadian dollars to take out the impact of big currency swings in the separately managed accounts that we manage you know where a portfolio might be 30 to 40 individual positions at a time when we think Canadian dollar could be stronger, we'll focus more in the Canadian marketplace. And generally, when the Canadian dollar is strengthening, it's because it favors our Canadian our Canadian universe. Uh, so we do take to take that into account. And the final question for today, Dave, is directed for you. This gentleman is asking. He, um, you know, we've always heard uh, sell in May and go away. So the question is, um, why do you think it's important for financial managers to insist on remaining in the in the markets from May to October? Well, I, I can't I can't ever speak for somebody else. We don't ever feel we have to stay in the market. You know, if our work tells us to get defensive, we'll we'll get defensive. Um, but uh, those sell in May and go away statistics are not worth much, but the paper they're written on, unless you really understand the environment that you're in. If you took all of the years from 1929 to present, like 1981 through 2000, 1951 through 66, 2013 through the present, Sell in May and go away really has not been a very good strategy. It's, 
it's been it's been wrong way more than it's been right. Now, in 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 secular bear markets like two thousand to two thirteen or nineteen uh, twenty nine through nineteen fifty one. You know, sell and may go away. It was pretty good. So, if, in fact, if you if you look at the data, um, you can get some bumpiness in July, um, and you can certainly get some bumpiness in August. Uh, but there have been lots of years where the market has a great summer rally. So to 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 take to take an adage like that and use it to make decisions. If if our if our work points and tells us to get really defensive, we'll get defensive but I'd rather do that uh, and understand the current environment than to impose our view on whatever the environment is. Well, it certainly speaks to our tactical nature. With that, David, we do not have any more questions. Diana, thank you so very much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have your insight. And uh, I know our viewers always enjoy hearing your, your um, points of view and what you're seeing. And, and so we thank you for joining us. Dave, I'll leave you with the final word and look forward to seeing everybody next week. So, so I think the last thing that I leave with is that certainly there is a lot of conversation right now about what the surge in the Delta variant means to markets. Um, there are lots of people who will point to the fact that there's a lot of people who are unvaccinated and really this is a wave of the unvaccinated, those that choose or cannot get, get a vaccination. Um, but I, I would caution people from making an investment decision based on what's happening with the coronavirus, because we know what happened at the height of the coronavirus last spring, the markets took off like a rocket. Uh, and the color you had lots of people about because they were concerned about what might happen going forward with, with corona. Um, so I think that you have to take the weight of all of the evidence, the earnings, the dividend growth, the interest rate policy, the liquidity, um, all of those things in making the decision. And given all of the liquidity in this market, uh, and given the fact that we are looking at the early stages of a new economic cycle, um, I think that it's, it's probably not the right thing to get too pessimistic. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, Pam, for hosting. Diana, oh, thanks for joining pleasure. us. Thanks for, having for all of those who, who are with us on a summer day. I hope you're enjoying getting outside and, and, uh, and you have some fun in summer. And, and if you've got questions, please don't hesitate to call us or email us. Uh, if you'd like more information on, on what we're doing in portfolios, please reach out uh, and everybody enjoy the day.